Hey, I'm Patterson Hood. I play in Drive-By Truckers, and it is time to connect. Patterson Hood. Hey, man, thanks so much for taking the time to connect. How are you doing? Man, doing great. Glad to be here. Are you up in Portland? I am. Yeah. You're, you're kind of in the middle of a, of a run, aren't you? Did you guys, the uh, truckers played some, some gigs in Colorado. Is that right? We just did a full month, pretty much the whole month of oh. February and uh, playing mostly dates that were supposed to have been in the spring of 2020. And gotcha. uh, it, it went good. Finally, it was great to finally get to play them. And uh, the band's in a great place and, and the, the shows were a lot of fun. The crowds were great real good i'm uh off this month and then i'm touring most of april i mean if i'm not mistaken you you guys have a huge run coming up uh it, it seems like if, yeah. I, if i remember your your website your books april through i mean through the summer you got a big run coming up yeah we'll we'll be playing uh i mean we'll be playing a lot through the rest of the year for sure yeah it's good to be back isn't it i mean that was for, for me and a lot of my friends, I know that that was one of the biggest, we've had a lot of challenges the last two years, haven't we, with COVID, but one of the biggest challenges was was not being able to play gigs. Was that was that one of the big challenges for you? Oh, yeah, you know, and I mean, you know, our life's so intertwined with it because it was a, you know, it made a challenge on a, on a personal mental level, but it was also, you know, a financial because this is my livelihood and, uh, and I was essentially unemployed for a year and a half. And, um, you know, it, it was rough and just feeling isolated, you know, not getting to not getting to see my band, not getting to, you know, see anybody but my immediate family for a, such a majority of the time. I'm kind of a extroverted person. So it was uh, it, it was, you know, it, it hit us extroverts pretty hard. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And um, our, our drummer, our drummer is the opposite. He's like, I've been practicing this for this my whole life. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sort of an ambivert. I, I have, uh, I, I have kind of both qualities and I, there are aspects of it that I enjoyed. I, I have to admit right. almost guiltily, but, but, uh, but man, I did miss playing live. And that first gig, what was your first gig after a, a long time off? Do you remember what it was? Yeah, we played, um, we, we had a tour book for last summer. We had some, well, uh, a handful of dates booked last summer, but then at the last minute ended up booking an additional date that was before them. And so, you know, we had originally planned to, to get together before those dates and uh, actually, you know, uh, play together and, 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 and reacquaint. But then this other date came up. And so we ended up doing it first and, uh, it was up in Montana. It was a one-off. I think we were, I, I believe we were replacing someone else that had been on the bill that canceled or something. So it was a very kind of last minute thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we literally walked out on stage, no sound check, no rehearsal. We had not been in the same room together in a year and a half and uh, walked on totally cold. And I was thinking, oh, Montana, it'll be this like, really small little festival but it was like a shit ton of people and yeah, uh sure. you know it's like walking out in front of you know 15,000 or more people after not playing together that long and it was awesome it was it was so great we played really well it was uh fiercely hot another thing surprising thinking oh Montana it'll be breezy and nice it was like you know you know, 98 degrees in the shade, and we were not on the shade. We were not in the shade, and uh, so it was brutally hot. But uh, again, it was just wonderful. We were and just so glad to be playing. I'm sure you killed it. I, I've, I've thought for a long time, whether it's, you know, whether it's gigging or public speaking or anything you kind of have to, any performance that you have to do, one of the secret ingredients is, is bringing a sense of gratitude to it. You know, if you feel right. like, God damn, I'm I'm lucky to be here. This is then you perform so much better. And how can you not feel that way after not playing and not yeah. being with your your bandmates for so long? That that doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah, that so entered into of, the whole tour too, for sure. Oh, you bet. And for and hopefully we'll retain that, Patterson. We won't lose that sense. You know, we won't get numb to it, and we'll continue to feel that gratitude for each other. You know. 
for sure, for sure. Yeah. And you know, and and I I wasn't exactly negative about it just before. I mean, I I you know right. Oh yeah. You know, our band's been through a lot through the years, but we had kind of come out of the other end of that a pretty good while ago. And so you know, I've. I've been happier with my band and my job these last, you know, nine or 10 years than I've ever been before. So, so, you know, so it all started when we were in a pretty good place. And so, but it's definitely, it, it's definitely driven that point home for everybody for sure. Right on, man. I want to ask you, there's, I've got a lot of questions, probably more than we have time for, but uh, one of the things I want to get into a little bit is your songwriting, but I wanted to ask you, speaking of gigs about, you know, I'm coming to you from Texas and, uh, one of our favorite, I guess Dan's is probably a little bit, Dan Silverleaf is probably a little bit like the 40 watt in Athens, you know, one of those places that is almost holy to you. And I just wonder, I'm curious what your, what your memories, what your thoughts are when you think of Dan Silverleaf. Well, it's funny because we, uh, we used to play, was it called Dan's Bar before, mm -hmm. before the Silverleaf? He had mm -hmm. the place that was, uh, uh, a little different location, a little smaller, and uh, that's where we first played Denton, and we played there a number of times. That's where I first met the Centromatic guys, yeah. uh, and uh, I already knew Brent and the Slobberbone guys from having done sound for them at the club I worked in at the mm -hmm. Hi-Hat in Athens, but, uh, and so I think they actually I think they opened for them the first time we played dance bar. And uh, so we went, we went back way far with them from that. And I always loved Dan. What a great guy. What a, 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 you know, every, every town that has a scene, that's part of having a scene is having that person yeah. like Dan or, or, or Barry and Valina at the 40 watt in Athens or that person that nurtures and can and make gives it a place for it to happen because without that there is no scene and uh and it was a, it was immediately apparent first time we met Dan it's like oh he's that guy you know yeah. in the best of ways and uh uh we always had wonderful times and um and then of course my my most recent memory of 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 the silver of that room was a uh, you know the, a bittersweet one because it yeah. was 2014 going to see Centromatics you know what we at the time thought would be the very last show and fortunately yeah. it's not but uh uh I, I flew in for that show and uh opened it and uh then stood there watching them play for two hours with you know tears just pouring out of me because yeah. uh that band's very very special to me they're they're you know that that's one of the bands of my life that's the most special to me yeah me too man you know we've had a conversation about that before and i didn't make it to i could not it was killing me i couldn't make it to that 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 supposed last show at dan's but i was at uh i was at the show in austin i think the night before and right. i may have shared this with you but it, it's worth sharing again I, I remember i i was about to the point of tears before they even went on stage and and I, I walked over and, and, and Will and uh, Matt Pence were leaning against the wall about ready to go on stage. And I went over and I was kind of blubbering something about how, how you know, how upsetting this is. It's their last show. And, and Will looked at me and he said, hey, man, put your glove on and get in the game. <laughs> Which is very, very Will. <laughs> very Will. And then, you know, I instantly put a smile on my face. And I said, you're right. Let's, let's, what are we worried about? Let's go have some fun. Well, uh, one thing I want to ask you about, Patterson, is is what were you like as a kid? Because I, I know enough about you to know, I mean, man, when, when your dad, um, you know, is hanging out with the Rolling Stones recording Brown Sugar and, and Aretha and, and uh, you know, all those folks at Muscle Shoals, I know your, your youth was not, you know, typical. Uh, did you no. know, what kind of kid were you? And did you always know? pretty much always know was there a point in time where you said I guess I'm going to be in music uh, yeah I mean I, I, I always and uh music or film because those were the two those were my two loves and uh and as far as like you know as far as you know besides my family those are still my two loves and uh I, I have always been a, a fanatical film nut 
and, and music fanatic. But um, so, you know, growing up, it was always going to be one or the other or some mixture of them. And then uh, somewhere along the way, you know, I started playing in bands and not making films. <laughs> so it, it sort of it sort of decided for me. And uh, it's like I, I it's like I kind of know how to do this and I don't really know how to do that other thing. So mm-hmm. I guess this is the thing I'm going to do. But, uh, you know, so I was a really weird kid. I was a, I was very much a misfit for the time and place that I was in because, you know, Muscle Shoals with this glorious musical history that it has, it, it wasn't at that time and place particularly glorious otherwise. You know, the, 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 it, it's, it's actually kind of cool now. And I, I, when I go home now, I kind of marvel at, at a lot of the things that have been happening in the last decade or so there. But, but you know, the, the music scene that happened, it was like a secret society. So, you know, the locals didn't really know that was happening. The majority of the lo- locals had no idea. And they, they, they kept it that way on purpose because they figured, well, if they knew this was happening, they would shut us down. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was a dry county. So you can imagine the reaction the Rolling Stones would get in that dry county coming yeah. in doing brown sugar. You know, it just wasn't, it, it's like they're not going to take any chances because all it would have taken was one incident and it would have ended the whole thing. And so they were very careful about it. And I learned, I learned really quickly not to talk about it at school to, to, to the kids there. And they wouldn't have, because they wouldn't have, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have gone well, you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and I was, uh, I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like sports, that made me suspect already, I mean, this is roll tide country, and I was not, you know, I was not into any of that, and so I got beat up a lot, and uh, I was bullied a lot as a kid, and, um, you know, I was, I was introverted, by, not by my nature, but more by force, because I didn't really have a friend group growing up until, you know, by high school, I'd kind of figured out how to, how to do it, and how to, how to, you know, and I actually had, I actually had a pretty nice high school time, but, uh, you know, my, my earlier childhood was the rougher part for me on all that, and, uh, because I did have some really close friends by high school that, that was all, that made it all much better, and um, so I, I, I was the kid, I sat in class and wrote songs and I made terrible grades because I sat in class and wrote songs and didn't listen. And I wrote, you know, I, I, I'd written over a thousand songs before I finished high school. I, I, I wrote literally every day. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, seventh grade, I sat behind this really pretty girl that I had super, super terrible crush on. And I basically wrote songs to her all day you know, <laughs> she didn't know I existed, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, so I was that kid, and, yeah. uh, you know, and it paid off as I got older, because I, I taught myself how to do this thing, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, a thousand songs by the time you got out of high school, man, yeah, that's, that that's literally, yeah, that's unbelievable, and, and, uh, they weren't good ones, I don't, yeah, I understand, uh, they were, I understand. not a thousand good songs, you know, not I understand. even, probably at that point not even two or three good songs I mean it was just a lot of really bad songs but uh you know I I started writing when I was eight and or started writing them down when I was eight I think before that I heard them in my head but didn't realize I think I was eight when it was like oh I should write these down you know and 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 you know I was eight and 73 so I was basically trying to figure out how to rip off Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. You know, I was a huge Elton John fan. Yeah. And uh, then at about 11 or t- about 12, I became a huge Todd Rundgren fan. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of my, you know, early songs were really just trying to figure out how to do what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing Neil Young figured in there at some point. Was that later? He did a little later. And yeah. uh, I grew up hearing him because he was my dad's favorite. And so I heard a lot of, okay. of uh, although it tended at that point to be more the the harvest type Neil Young as opposed to uh-huh. the, you know, when I was in high school, I got really into Russ Never Sleeps. That came out my freshman year in high school and yeah. became a bit of an obsession. And uh, 
And and that's when I became like a, a huge Neil Young fan. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. This I don't know if you can see this. This record here, that first that first oh yeah solo record, his was was really big for me. I'm a little bit older than you. Uh, you you actually you have a birthday coming up this month, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you do you talk about how old you are? Is that something? Yeah, I'm I'll I'm I'm yeah I'll be I'll be fifty eight, and uh, yeah. Yeah. you know right next to that record. Uh, I actually just talked about it in the interview a few minutes ago because uh, Mike Mills is singing a backup vocal on our new record. And, oh, cool. Uh, and uh, Life's Rich Pageant, I, I literally taught myself how to sing backup vocals by the summer of 86, driving around, listening to Life's Rich Pageant, trying to learn how to sing the Mike Mills parts. And uh, and, and was Adam's house cat favorite, going was my favorite. Yeah, that was Adam's house cat. And yeah. he's always been my favorite backup singer other than Emmy Lou, I guess. And uh, as far as as far as that goes, as far as harmonies go, I've always just loved what Mike Mills did. And yeah. uh, and per and specifically that record was the one because they really turned the vocals up on that record. And I was already a fanatical fan, but so I would just drive around trying to sing the backup parts on th on those songs. Yeah, right on, right on. Uh, so with this many songs and this much of a history, as you said, not necessarily all good songs, but I'm curious what, if you have a process, if you, um, you're, you're a storyteller for one thing. I mean, and I'm curious if you always have been a storyteller and, and, and how that happened in your songs, because one of the things you and I have talked about before is, is Will Johnson's lyrics and, and mine, frankly, are very similar in the sense that I think you said, I know every word, but I don't know what the hell they mean, right? Right. Um, kind of impressionistic and that's more the way I write which you know I'm attracted to that kind of songwriting but sometimes it can be a little cop out because when you try to write a story kind of song it's so easy to fall into cliche it's it's one of the things I admire about your songwriting is that you're able to pull that off um, do you t are you compelled to tell a story when you write a song do you write melodies and chord progressions first and then find a way to fit the song how, how does it work for you generally it's all generally because I, I I don't have a rule or a or an exact process, but mm -hmm. uh, but the general answer is I hear it in my head, and it's like an antenna, and it's like a radio station, a radio transmission from somewhere far beyond, and I pick it up and I try to write it down before it goes away, and uh, you know there'll be an idea I might have that I think oh that would be a great idea for a song but sometimes it might be years before it's actually a song I'll, I'll, I, and sometimes I might write down a line or a hook or a thought or a title probably more often a title than anything that I'll that I'll have but it's still it might be years and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the the best ones tend to happen the most organically with the least thought the least conscious thought uh for years i didn't edit which i regret because i i wish i had them i wish i, I look back now on the catalog and I go ah damn i wish i'd you know i wish mm -hmm. i'd gone back and and fixed this line or whatever mm -hmm. but for years i was kind of superstitious about it because i thought well i'm i'm being given this this gift from somewhere else that I've got no control over and so I shouldn't try to control it and mm. it was it was years later like years into making records later that uh uh that that it's like you know it, it it isn't disrespectful to that to do this to make it better I should try to make each thing as good as I can make it and uh uh and, and that wasn't like an overnight realization but it was a but it but it, it there's definitely a turning point mm -hmm. in my writing from where that happened uh probably somewhere around the brighter and creations dark to big to do era and uh uh if i had to put a timeline on it i would say working with booker would have been would have been maybe an impetus for that because i okay. learned that was like going to like a graduate school even though it was only four days that we made that record uh 
potato hole with him. Those four days amounted to like a three-year graduate course for me as an artist in, in, in playing and writing. Because I learned, I learned more about myself in those four days than most people learn in a decade. Uh, and I think, I think I speak for the whole band in that because it, it had such a, a phenomenal impact on all of us, uh, what, what he taught us making that record. And uh, uh, that I can, I can look at a timeline of my songs and go, oh, that's, that was written after Booker. Wow. <laughs> that was written before Booker. It was, wow. that, it was that big a deal. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, don't, man, don't forget, you know, Walt Whitman uh, with Leaves of Grass published, God knows, I don't remember the, the count, how many different editions. And he would go back, every edition he would change, yeah. he would change stuff. So I think well, it'd be I certainly fun. do. I certainly do. do, you do like when I, when I play a song now, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't play it necessarily with any regard to how it was written. I mean, really, it's more just a matter of of what's recorded that I can't go back and and change. Sure, but, uh, I hear you. Yeah. But uh, I, I, you know, if I if I if I think of a better way to phrase or sing or play something now, I certainly do. Good, 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 good. And that's why I like the live records because they yeah. they they that gives me a chance to to change it. Yeah, know. right on. Well, let's see. You've mentioned you've mentioned um, Booker and Elton John and Todd, and we talked about uh, Neil Young a bit. I'm curious. One of the things I'm asking my guests is, what about Bob? What about Bob Dylan? And what what? I know you you actually met him when you were a kid. I think I saw right. that in, in that documentary um, film, or maybe I met I, I heard it somewhere else. But but I'm just curious how you think of him. What kind of Im impact he's had on you? Do you agree with Steve Earle when he says all of us are now post Bob Dylan songwriters, uh, that he's that important? I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are about Bob. I mean, he's such a huge presence. It's hard to even, you know, that's like, uh, I mean, you know, you know, of course, you know, he was already around and huge before I was by the time I was right. born. So I, right. I know there, I know no pre Bob, as far as that goes, yeah. you know, growing up the first, you know, my first exposure to him was, was literally meeting him. I mean, I was a little kid and, uh, Incredible. uh and that summer, cause he was in town, uh, play, he first came to Muscle Shoals to play harmonica on a, on a, uh, Right. Uh, on, on a Donnie Fritz record yeah. and uh he uh uh and so when I met him I I, I you know I met him uh I had a play date with his son they didn't right. call him play dates then but I, yeah. I yeah. uh he had his son uh Jesse his oldest son with him and uh and yeah. I'm sure Jesse was bored you know and so they set up and we were about the same age uh, I think I'm a I might be a year or two older. And so, uh, so it was arranged that I would spend the day with Jesse. And so that's how I met, that's how I met Bob Dylan. And, uh, uh, and I've never seen Jesse since then, even though I'm wow. aware of what he's done as a filmmaker and stuff. But, uh, and I, I ended up becoming friendly with Jacob some mm -hmm. years later, mm -hmm. uh, who's maybe one of the most hilarious people I've ever met. But uh, okay. truly, I've always heard that about about Bob Dylan that he, you know, people who know him personally, how funny he is. And, uh, uh, I could, I could totally get that. But, um, so, so, but that same summer knocking on heaven's door was a huge hit. And so I would hear it on the yeah. radio and it goes, Oh, that's that guy I met. I love, and I loved that song. And I remember hearing lay lady lay maybe around that time, but it uh -huh. was, you know, a couple years later that I started hearing, you know, the classic era stuff. And, um, and then as a songwriter, the first song that really influenced me was Her was Hurricane, because that came out the summer, uh, the, the spring that I turned 12. And, Man, uh, yeah, I can I, see that. I got, I got desire for my 12th birthday. as well as one of the presents I got. And uh, 
uh, I didn't really get the album at the time, but I loved that song. I was obsessed with the story of it. And, yeah. uh, and I remember seeing Saturday Night Live do some kind of thing about, you know, about Reuben Carter and, uh, and, uh, I, I met Ronnie Blakely about that time because she made a record right around that time too in Muscle Shoals. And, um, so, uh, so all of that kind of, kind of entered in, uh, but to answer your earlier question, I didn't really start writing story songs until way, way later. And, oh, okay. Uh, so even I, in high I, school, those songs were not really story songs. I don't think so. I don't okay. think it even occurred to me to yet, even though I was listening to Hurricane, I think that seemed way beyond my grasp at the time. I gotcha. probably started trying to do that during the Adams House Cat era, but I probably didn't start getting decent at it until around the time yeah, I really started teaching myself how to do that leading up to the formation of the drive by truckers and, wow. uh, and Southern rock opera. I, I just thought of the living Bubba that there's a, there's right. an early, well, early yeah, one. I mean, that is, that is a, that, that certainly is, you know, uh, I guess it tells a story, uh, in a more kind of impressionistic way, I guess, yeah. but yeah, yeah but it, it feels like a story. It, it clearly, right. you know, it's, it's not one of the stories or it's not one of the songs that you listen to and say, I have no idea what that's about. You, you kind of know what that's about. Right. Uh, so let me bring it full circle and say, you know, if Bob, I had to, if I had to pick one, that's the one. I mean, if I had to pick one song yeah. that, that, you know, you know, it's like if, 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 if everything else was going to be erased and I could leave one behind, that would probably be the one. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, that one's special. Special on a on a, yeah. the deepest level, probably to me. Well, I think that probably answers my next question, but maybe not. I I, I had such a clever question. I was going to say, uh, imagine Bob Dylan comes knocking on your door today, and he says, "Patterson, play me one of your songs." That'd probably be it. That'd be a good one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'd probably do that one. You know, you yeah. know, Jason Isbell would say I should do Heathens. That's the one he I, likes. I, I I'm I'm not in disagreement with that by the way and and i, I, I th it always makes me happy that he likes that song so much you know yeah. and and when we first met i had just written it and uh so it's probably one of the first songs he ever heard me do you know when we actually met and uh uh which was well before the song got recorded because he was in the band by the time we cut it so uh wow but yeah yeah and and so to, to continue on you play that song for dylan and he says okay great now play me one cover song. What would you choose? Oh, wow. I don't know. You know. <laughs> I mean, do you, yeah, I, 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 I mean, probably pay no attention to Alice because I know it. And, okay. uh, and, and because he, you know, he did kind of famously diss Tom T in a, in a, in an interview, which I still can't quite wrap my head around because it's like, really, how yeah. do you diss that? I mean, right. it's like, right. you're like, really? Uh, uh, yeah. It's like, you know, it'd be a great choice. There, I there's, think, but... there's gotta be a, there's gotta be some kind of some, some, something that happened personally in a bar one night that, that caused yeah. that. Cause I yeah. can't otherwise imagine anyone not thinking Tom T is just, I mean, good God, you know, speaking of story songs, it doesn't yeah. get better, but, right. but he got, he went way beyond that too. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, he, he could write other things. That mm -hmm. just happened to be what he's famous for writing. And he was the master at telling the story without actually telling it, which is really the thing. And, yeah. uh, and that's what I, that's what I most would like. And, and, and hopefully maybe that's what the living Bubba does. You know, it doesn't really tell the story. It just, it, it implies a story and you, and you tell it yourself in your own head. But, yeah. uh, but, you know, pay no attention to Alice. I, I mean, I'll never forget the first time I heard that song and, uh, and, and, and then rewinding it and playing it again. And then again, we were all in the band together, the band and someone had made us a Tom T tape because they thought that uh, was, uh, Joe Swank is the guy's name and he lives in Carbondale, Illinois. And he, uh, he, uh, he was an early fan, super early fan of the band. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, he asked me about Tom T. And it's like, yeah, you know, I kind of remember him from hearing about him as a kid, but probably never listened to him. And he made us this tape and we played it in the van. 
And we were all just like became obsessed. We just played yeah. it over and over and over. That's great. That's great. Well, let's see. Do you mind if we we kind of move towards wrapping up with with some kind of rapid fire questions? Okay, I'll try. And 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 it you can you can pass or you can say I'll answer it, but it's not going to be rapid fire. Or you can just give the the rapid fire answer. Um, one of the most influential books you've read in your life. Um, unbearable lightness of being. Great. It's way That's up great. there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, more recently, the Orphan Master's Son, which just blows me away by so Adam Johnson, I believe. And okay. uh, I think it won the Pulitzer. Holy okay. shit. Wow. Okay. What an amazing book. Right on. What pisses you off? <laughs> uh, uh, 2020. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear you. Uh, uh, that 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 asshole running for Congress in, in Michigan who who uh, basically didn't learn the lesson that Ann Richards had to teach uh, some guy in Texas a few dec couple of decades ago. And he said that. Uh, I just read this today, so it's fresh on my mind. He 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 said something about telling his daughters if they realize they're getting raped to lay back and enjoy it. And yeah. uh, it's like, didn't hadn't we been here before? Didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot that can piss us off. With, with that in yeah. mind, next question is, how do you deal with the slings and arrows of of life and these things that piss us off and throw us off? balance and and are so hard to tolerate what are, do you have methods do you meditate do you have any kind of uh, practice that helps you deal with these inevitable slings and arrows of life well historically writing that's how i got into writing uh writing was how i dealt with everything and uh uh that was you know from my from my childhood on that was that was that was my way of dealing with being the weird misfit kid that didn't have friends as a kid or whatever or you know whatever angst from parents or whatever you deal with school mm -hmm. it all went into my writing and uh you know as i've gotten older that hasn't been as practical a thing and so i've been you know i mean i've i you know i, I have therapy you know it's just awesome and uh and and definitely helps and uh you mentioning uh, i'm actually really interested in trying to learn more about meditation i haven't done that but i'm i'm definitely have an interest about that because i think that might help might be good for my writing you know so yeah i uh, another time but i'd love to i'd love to talk about that i'm a, a big proponent i've been practicing it for many many years i teach it um and and um would love to talk about it. but that's for another time a couple other quick questions what happens when we die um, who knows? I mean, you know, I'm not particularly religious, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at all. But uh, but I don't know. I mean, I don't have any. Okay. You know, maybe there is something. Maybe it's like the force. Maybe yeah. you're just part of the force. I don't know. I, I really don't have. Not don't something know. you think about or or worry about. I mean, I try not to. It's, yeah. You know, it's 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 nothing I nothing I have any knowledge of. And sure, you know. Yeah. So. Right on. Yeah. This is this one's too hard, so don't hold yourself to. to I, I understand your answer could be different tomorrow, and that's okay. Uh, the old classic: you're on a deserted island, and you can bring one album to listen to the rest of your life. What comes to mind? Historically, it's always been something, anything by Todd Rundgren. I mean, yeah. there's, it that, might, was, that was huge. It, there might be the the other one. If there was two, the other one probably changes every single day, and uh, uh, you know. The Glands self-titled second album might be the other one. I've, I've probably played it more in the last 22 years than anything in the last 22 years. So that might be the other one. But okay. and I could probably find some common ground between those two that might that might be that might explain something about me. I don't know. <laughs> Most memorable show, not that you've played, but you that you attended. What comes to mind? Uh, first time I saw Bruce Springsteen, the e Street Band, in uh, February 13th, 1981, Friday the 13th, in wow. Starkville, Mississippi. I ran away from home to go, and uh, literally, and uh, 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 it was oh, life. Man. It was very life changing. Uh, 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 every show before that was 
one thing, every show after that was something that got compared to that and, and nothing ever quite came up to that. You know? man, man. Have you read that? Have you read his, uh, his autobiography? Yeah. yeah it's good. It's great. It's real good. Yeah. I just re actually read it recently. Uh, two more questions. What do you want people to know about you? Probably the songs. I mean, that's, you know, I think that's, I think that's what I do. That's what I do. I mean, yeah. so. Yeah. I think it, it, I think it was Matt Tents when I was talking to him. I believe it was him that we talked about the fact that really that's the whole point of music is to connect with people. Right. You know? Yeah. All right. Last question, man. When you are dead and gone, what do you hope people say about you? I mean, I hope I'm remembered as a, you know, pretty good guy. I think I was a pretty okay person, you know. Uh, I would like to be remembered as having been pretty good at my job, you know. Yeah. But. Yeah, I think you're safe in those in in those wishes, man. Uh, hey, what a pleasure! What an honor! Thank you so much for taking this time to connect. Patterson, I'm a huge fan, and yeah, I'm thank just, you. That's a great room, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's a really thank great you. looking room. Yeah, I, I'm just blown away that you gave me this time, man. I'm I really am grateful. I appreciate it. I've been a fan for many, many years, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you some more. I'm 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 hoping you'll do some solo shows. It's, it, that's not something you've done a whole lot of lately, is it? Um, I did some last summer. I did a uh, like five in December. Okay. I'm kind of thinking late fall, I might do more. Uh, Good. You know, the band's going to be really busy through the summer, and, and, and we're doing some work in the fall, maybe not as heavy as, as some falls. So I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking maybe November, December, I'll, I'll get out and do more than usual. I, I hope you will. Um, I, I assume that when you play a, a song like Heathens in a solo show, it's just you and acoustic guitar, that that's how it was written originally. Yeah, 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 you know, but, and, but, and uh, but, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, it's funny because uh, what I'd said earlier about the good ones coming really fast and being kind of easy, that one's kind of an outlier about that because that song was written in three different pieces, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I wrote the music to it like exactly like if you hear the song if you hear what i play on guitar on the record i wrote that in one sitting at west freed's at Wes and jill freed's living room in richmond virginia late one drunken night after a show and uh uh and and it was like exactly like you could place the song on top of what i wrote that night but there were no lyrics and every time i'd try to write lyrics to it i never had lyrics that i thought were were, that I liked enough to be worthy of, of that progression. And then I wrote the first half of the lyrics about a year later on a trampoline outside of Athens, Georgia. And I finished it in a garage in Denton, Texas before a show at Dan's Bar uh, at a friend's house uh, and, uh, and then played it that night at Dan's Bar. And Scott Dambaum sat in with me nice. on stage and played the song with me the first time I ever played it live. It was a solo show that night in, in Texas. He, he sat in and played along, even though he had never heard it before in his life. And that's when I asked him if he'd play on the record, which he did. So, Well, that man, that kind of brings us full circle. Hey, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And again, I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, good luck to you. And I'll see you down the road, man. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.